are you, Yahweh our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Barukata Yahweh Elohinu Malacharalem Asher Kishanu Bamisvata Vetivanu La Asak Pintere Torah. Please, Yahweh, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth, in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. We who live in the shelter of Elyon spend our nights in the shadow of Shaddai, who say to Adonai, our refuge, our fortress, our God in whom we trust. He will rescue us from the trap of the hunter, from the plague of calamities. He will cover us with his pinions, and under his wings we will find refuge. His truth is a shield and protection. We will not fear the terrors of night or the arrow that flies by day or the plague roams in the dark or the scourge that wreaks havoc at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near us. Only keep our eyes open, and we will see how the wicked are punished. For we have made Adonai the Most High, who is our refuge, our dwelling place. No disaster will happen to us. No calamity will come near our tent. For he will order his angels to care for us and guard us wherever we go. They will carry us in their hands so that we won't trip on a stone and we will tread down lions and snakes, young lions and serpents. We will trample underfoot. Jehovah says, because he loves me, I will rescue him. And because he knows my name, I will protect him. He will call on me and I will answer him and I will be with him when he is in trouble. I will extricate him and bring him honor. I will satisfy him with long life. Show him my salvation. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> wow, it's been a little while since we've talked about eschatology. This will be the fourth week because you, uh, you had Isaiah, then you had, uh, had a, because of the snow, or I should say ice, that was beautiful but horrible at the same time, right? And so now we're back. So we were in Matthew 24, and we stopped somewhere in the middle of Matthew 24, and we're going to continue on with Matthew 24, talking about this eschatology, talking about post-trib as opposed to pre-trib. And so um, <clears throat> we've gotten through, uh, like I said, Matthew 24, 1 through 36. Tonight we'll finish up with 24 and go into 25. So every specific scripture, I said this when I left you four weeks ago, every specific scripture that speaks of a time relationship between the tribulation and the return of Yeshua places his coming after the tribulation. And I know that we would like to be out of here before <clears throat> the wrath of God or the tribulation of Yehovah. But I'm sure that everyone down through the apostles and the patriarchs and matriarchs would have also liked to not have any testings, trial, tribulations, or anyone to be martyred or imprisoned or beaten or battered, anything like that. So the coming in Matthew 24, verses 30 through 31, <clears throat> is the only one Yeshua mentions. And if we're going to get what's going on, we know that Yeshua gives us the understanding, correct? So he only mentions, that's the only time it's mentioned by Yeshua, and it is his one-time return in order to replace, not replace, but rapture his people and inaugurate his kingdom. <clears throat> so if he knows he's coming and he knows the end from the beginning, then he's only saying one time he's returning. Now, who do we believe? Do we believe someone who's had a dream? Do we believe a uh, preacher that preaches from a pulpit, or do we believe the mouth of Yeshua and what he says? We have to believe him, correct? Um, <clears throat> we can study all we want, but and we can pervert and change and shift and uh, take things out and add things, but at the end of the day, it's his book. He wrote it, and he knows what's going on. So the parable of the fig tree <clears throat> underlines the main event, and that's where we came up to. We came up to the fig tree. So let's read verses 32 through 37. It says, now let the fig tree teach you its lesson. Now remember, Matthew 24 and 25 is about the second coming. It's about Yeshua returning. So what Yeshua is saying is the fig tree is going to give us an understanding, a lesson. When its branches begin to sprout and leaves appear, you know that summer is approaching, correct? 
In the same way, when you see all these things, you are to know that the time is near right at the door. Yes, I tell you that this people will certainly not pass away before all these things happened. <clears throat> Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But when that day and hour will come, and we know when he says that day <clears throat> and hour, we know he's talking about his coming, correct? No one knows, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father. For the Son of Man's coming will be just as it was, and then we have this understanding, in the days of Noah, in the days of Noah. <clears throat> this dawning of cosmic signs and wonders will give a period of warning before the sun of history finally sets. We will have warnings. We, we look at what's happening now, and we pinpoint, <clears throat> and we say, he's coming. He's coming tomorrow. He's coming <clears throat> this afternoon. He's, but we have other things that need to take place, and we have other things. But the signs and the wonders certainly give us understanding of, of what is about ready to occur. And no one knows that exact date. So if you have someone who's saying, this is the exact date when Yeshua is coming, well, you know they're a liar. Because if the sun don't know it, and the angels don't know it, I don't know why you think you know it. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? So the exact date or the hour is not known only by the Father. But the signs, however, are given to kind of strengthen us as believers in hope of Yeshua's near return. So the more that we see the signs unfolding, the more it should strengthen us. It shouldn't scare us. It shouldn't frighten us. <clears throat> it should strengthen us because that means that our hope is coming. Correct? Now, we can be sure that the generation which sees these signs and these wonders uh, will be the one which welcomes Yeshua to the earth. And that would be wonderful if it would be us. Wouldn't that be the wonderful? I mean, we, I, I thought sometimes the, the best generation would be those who were in the prophets or those that were with Abraham or those that were in the, the times of Yeshua or even the times of the book of Acts. But what a blessing it would be to be the generation that sees the lightning and the thunder and the, and the light and the Son of God coming through the clouds. Wouldn't that just be like, wow, that, I was in part of that generation. And so we know that's coming, right, according to the Word of God. So let's look at Matthew 24, 37 and 39, because it says, For the Son of Man's coming will be just as it was in the days of Noah. Well, when we see the days of Noah, then we need to do a study on the days of Noah. <clears throat> and we'll, not tonight, but we will go unfold that a little bit next week, because to understand what he's talking about in Matthew 24, we have to understand what happened in Genesis. Correct? He says, back then, and he gives us a little bit of understanding, back then before the flood, people went on eating and drinking, taking wives and becoming wives, right up till the day Noah entered the ark. <clears throat> That's very important. Because nothing changed other than signs and wonders. But everyone was still doing the same thing. There's not a movement of people being left or taken and then things happen. <clears throat> everyone is doing the same thing, right? And they didn't know what was happening until the flood came, both righteous and unrighteous. Now, I know that only Noah and his wife and his children got in. However, they weren't taken away either before. They were there when the flood came. They were there when the flood <clears throat> uh, devastated, correct? <clears throat> they were in a safe harbor of an ark, but they still were there. And so it says, and they did not know what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. Who did it sweep away? The everyone, but the sweeping away was the removal was the evil people, not the good people. Okay? <clears throat> it will be just like that. Who is saying this? Yeshua. It will be just like that when the Son of Man comes. So we know that the, the days of Noah is connected. The days of Noah are connected to the second coming of Yeshua. We know that Noah was uh, eccentric uh, for the simple reason we say that because he's building an ark in a desert basin. That makes you a little odd, <clears throat> at least to all the people around you. Correct? <clears throat> I mean, wouldn't you be odd 
If you're in a desert and you're building an ark because you said rain's coming and no one's ever heard about rain, the only time that the earth was watered was from the dew. It had not rained until this time, so no one understands it. And not only does it rain, but it also the earth busts forth because we have to realize understanding that it's not just the rain didn't come and flood the earth. The rain came, but he opened up the, the earth and the, everything, all the cisterns and the wells and the, and the rivers underneath all came up. That's why it was able to do what it did in such a short time. So who else, unless you're eccentric, would build a boat in the middle of a desert? But no one knew something that his contemporaries did not know. He knew that Yehoah was unhappy and that judgment was coming soon. If we're smart and we understand, we know that Yehovah is not happy. And we also know that judgment is coming soon. And where does judgment begin? In the house. <clears throat> so what we have is three conclusions. We're going to talk about three conclusions tonight. Three conclusions, and then we're going to talk about more than that, but three conclusions in Noah's account that relate to Yeshua's return. Because he says, as in the days of Noah, so will my return be. The first thing that we see, the first conclusion, the first discovery in this Noah account that's related to Yeshua's return is that Noah's rescue was on the same day as Jehovah's judgment on the ungodly. He saved Noah on the same day of judgment. So there's not a separate saving. There is a saving and a judgment happening at the exact same time. And that's what we said, the rapture of God's people, where we meet him in the air. He's coming. <clears throat> we know he's coming. The sound of the trumpet, the lightning, the, the, the light, the, 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 the sun being, you know, dull because of the light of who he is. So we're meeting him. But when we're meeting him, we're, he's still coming. Right. <clears throat> the prodigal. That's returning the son, uh, the father's still waiting at the edge. So he's coming. And, and while the father is going to meet him, there's a there's a same moment that's happening. So it is too much to believe that Yeshua wanted us to learn from Noah's experience that just as Jehovah kept his servant from contamination of a very corrupt world, spared him the judgment of uh, punishment of judgment. Yehovah will keep us. Don't don't sell him short. He is able to keep us. Whatever we might go through, even if we don't go through anything, he still can keep us. You know, I'm not saying that everyone's going to go through something. Everyone's going to be a martyr. You know, some will come out with nothing except being uncomfortable. You know, in the, in the storm, some were just uncomfortable because of the cold, but they still had their electricity and they still had their water. And then some of us didn't have any electricity, <clears throat> but we had water. And some of you didn't have electricity or water. And then it comes on at different times, right? I mean, uh, Byron and Dee were beside me to my right. Pastor Kenny <clears throat> is be, uh, behind us. And we got lights, except for them, 50 feet away and 50 feet away. For at least a day, we had lights and they didn't have lights. My only point is that we don't know what we're going through. We don't know what God has planned for us. We, we read on Saturday that he, in, he saw us in, as an embryo and he knows in the book that everything is already done. <clears throat> but he can keep us, can he? <clears throat> he can keep us out of a fiery furnace. He can keep us while we're in a fiery furnace. <clears throat> so Noah's response uh, or rescue was on the same day as Jehovah's judgment of the ungodly. The, the second conclusion that we see is that Noah did not just tend the premises while waiting for Jehovah to drown the wicked. You know, we sit back, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and we kind of sit back, fold our hands, and wait for God to come and wipe everybody out. That's not what Noah did. <clears throat> what Noah did was he preached, he taught, he warned, he urged, he pled. He declared the greatness of Yehovah with a severity of dabbling with divine patience. He wants you to know, do not dabble with God's patience. We are experiencing grace and mercy, but don't dabble in it. Which means don't take it for granted, right? You will get caught. It will unfold. There will be a light. It will be shouted from the mountaintop. Somewhere. 
So <clears throat> Noah never knew when the rain would fall, but he knew it would be soon because the signs were there. I don't know whether Yeshua is coming tomorrow or the next day or tonight. I do know signs are here. Maybe not complete signs because we know that some things have to happen, but we know it's getting closer, just like a <clears throat> childbirth. We know the child's coming. We just don't know when it's coming, but we know it's coming, and we know as the woman screams more, it's coming closer. So though times were hard for Noah, he stayed loyal to Yehoah, and he stayed loyal to his calling. It would have been simple just not to build the ark. You don't even have anyone but your wife and children surrounding you. But thank God he had his wife and children. Because sometimes you don't even have that. Right? So <clears throat> you don't see him grandstanding. You know, you don't see him raised in a, a place where he sits and he tells people, you know, I, I heard from God and you didn't. Um, he just built an ark. There's no grim reports. He's not complaining about what he has to do. He's not complaining about no one coming. He's not angry that no one's coming. He's not asking God, please kill them. You know, he's not like... Uh, um, Jonah who runs away and says, these guys don't deserve any repentance, right? He just keeps plowing. He just keeps building. He just keeps preaching. He just keeps pleading. It's not up to him to change anyone. It's only up to him to fulfill the calling of God in his life. God will do and God will complete whatever he needs to complete and God will call those he needs to call in. So we know that Noah, because of this long time of building an ark and no one coming, let's face it, if after a year no one came, we would be giving that up. So we know he's a fighter. We know that he's a good example for us in the end times because he continues to preach even it looks like no one's listening. He continues to warn even though they're laughing at him. He continues to urge even though no one's coming. He pleads with them. You know, you know that word pleading means that he still had concern and love for them even though that they were rejecting him and making fun of him. Most of us, we have to be careful because our heart becomes hardened. <clears throat> we're like, okay, I don't care. Then go to hell. Bottom line, done with you. Finish, right? <clears throat> so we know that all that time of building and, and, and working, he, he's still allowing his heart to be soft because he's doing what God's called him to do. He's not the one who brings the harvest. He's the one that plants the seed, and that's all he has to do. So in Yehoah's providence, the flood could not occur until the ark was finished. So we know that the rain's not coming halfway through. We know that the rain's not coming just because we saw a war or that we, we see <clears throat> the, the tide turning in a, a political agenda or whatever. We know that that's not going to be uh, the thing that's going to cause him to come. We know that that which has to be finished must be finished before he comes. The ark must be completed, correct? And we talked about that one thing that has to happen is that all the world hear about Yeshua, right? So for us, the return cannot occur until that great commission is accomplished. <clears throat> and perhaps this is the substance of what Peter's advice is in 2 Peter chapter 3, 12, when he says, as you wait for the day of God, how many are waiting for the day of God? We all know what that means, right? The second coming. <clears throat> As you wait for the day of God, what's the next part? Work. So your waiting is not sitting back. We're not going into a cave. We're not hiding somewhere. We're not all buying white robes so that we can look pretty when he comes. We are waiting for him to come, but at the same time, we are working. And we're working to do what? To hasten its coming. How do we hasten its coming? <clears throat> the longer you are quiet and silent with your family, with your relatives, with your friends, you are not allowing the power of God or the second coming of God to come quickly. You are actually delaying it. Because what has to happen is everyone needs to hear. And so God has placed you in certain situations where you are the voice <clears throat> and they can hear. I didn't say they have to receive it. They just have to hear it. And if you are afraid to speak it, if you are afraid to plead it, if you're afraid to warn them, if you're afraid to urge them, <clears throat> then that silence is actually delaying the coming of the Lord. So if you really want God to come quickly, then you should open up your mouth and really be a preacher. Really speak. <clears throat> it says, as you wait for the day of God and work to hasten its coming, that day will bring on the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt 
from the heat. That's a pretty vivid picture of what's going to happen when he comes, correct? And we want to hasten that day. <clears throat> and to hasten that day means we need to get busy about our Father's business. The, the third one that we have this, I, I think I have one, but it's supposed to be three. The third one is that no one knew at one point that he had only one week to go, seven days before the flood. We know when he began to build the ark, build the ark, he didn't know exactly the time. But as the time got closer, he then understood that he had shorter time. You should know you have shorter time. Listen, <clears throat> as you get older, even though I'm going to live to 120, right? Some of you are not claiming that. <clears throat> Your body tells you you're not living forever. Is that not true? Unless your body is a good liar, your body is telling you <clears throat> you're not living forever. As, as vibrant and as much as you can do to hold it back, let me just tell you, it is appointed unto man to die, which means you, from the very beginning, have started to decay. Correct? You can hold it back. I don't care how many pills you take. I don't care how many squats you do. I don't care how many times you run. I don't care what vitamins you eat or how much salad you eat. <clears throat> eat chocolate while you can. No. I'm just saying you will <clears throat> die. We are going to decay. Correct? So that means that the, the closer we get, you know, when you're young bucks like the, them back there, they... They have no understanding of what it is to die other than if they've been around people. Maybe they've seen, you know, but sometimes people haven't been around death very long. So they just are young. But when, you know, <clears throat> as you get older, you recognize. And so the thing is, as he starts to really unfold some things, you know, when you first start building the ark, it's one thing. When you're down to that last week, when you know you have one more board to put in and one more nail to hit, you know something's coming. Correct? So we also will have a countdown. The, the, the book of Revelation speaks of seven trumpets, and Yeshua returns at the last one. So we know there's seven trumpets. So we know when we hear the first one, okay, but we know when we hear number six, <laughs> there's only one left. So Matthew 24, verses 40 through 51 says, Then there will be two men in a field. One will be taken and the other left behind. There will be two women grinding at the uh, fl uh, flour at the meal. One will be taken the other left behind. So <clears throat> stay what? Stay alert or watch because you don't know on what day your Lord will come, but you do know this. Had the owner of the house known when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you too must always be Ready, for the Son of Man will come when you are not expecting him. Verse 45, who is the faithful and sensible servant whose master puts him in charge of the household staff to give them their food at the proper time? It will go well with that servant if he is found doing his job when his master comes. What will be good for him when he's found doing his job? job. Yes, I tell you that he will put him in charge of all he owns. But if that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is taking his time and he starts beating up his fellow servants, spends his time eating, drinking with drunkards, then his master will come on a day the servant does not expect at a time he doesn't know. And he will cut him in two and put him with the hypocrites where people will wail and grind their teeth. Wow. So here's Yeshua, who describes the separation of righteous from uh, the unrighteous, his people from Satan's people, we find in verses 40 and 41. When we look at that word taken, he takes one and leaves the other, right? Two women at a flour mill, one is taken, one <clears throat> um, is left. That word taken in the Greek, paralabano, take a good shot at it. It's the same where we find in John 14, 3 that says, Since I'm going to prepare a place for you, I will return to take you with me so that where I am you may be also. So we know he is coming. Correct? 
But we don't know whether he's coming and he's harboring us and he's sweeping the unrighteous away. Correct? We don't know when he's coming. So that <clears throat> two and one's taken could mean a couple things. But though um, <clears throat> when we look at those places where the rapture is described, Matthew's passage places the rapture in a time sequence in relation to other events, which means it will occur at the coming of the Son of Man after the tribulation. Remember, you have to keep the timing and the context where it needs to be. You can't change it because you want something else to occur. Right? Matthew 24, verse 42 says, So stay alert, because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. Stay alert. That word, watch. So it's not an excuse to kind of quit your job, take to the mountains, and wait for him, you know, laying on your back for a departure. You have to be working. What does it mean to be working? doing kingdom business. Now, it doesn't mean you don't do worldly business. And when I say worldly business is you have to eat, you have to live, you have to, right? <clears throat> so you have to maintain that. But what he really is talking about is that while you're maintaining that, are you preaching? Are you urging? Are you pleading? Are you warning? Or are you afraid? And if you are afraid and you are quiet, then you're not fulfilling the will of God and purpose of your life because the will of God and purpose of your life is that you be a witness. Correct? And if you don't warn and you don't plead, listen, when the rain came and they all rushed the ark, Noah had nothing to be sorry about. He warned them, he warned them, he warned them, and he warned them, which I really believe, which is why God shut the door. Because with his heart being so soft, even at the end <clears throat> where he's pleading with them, he probably would have opened the door. So God said, listen, you did your job, let me do mine. And their rejection cannot be changed by your heart. So I shut the door on them. Because they had the same opportunity to come into this ark as you did. And we all make decisions at the end when we see the end coming. And so, you know, if you died and you saw heaven and hell, of course you'll choose heaven. <laughs> That's not how it works, is it? So he tells us to watch. Watch is correctly translated, be on the alert, like the complete Jewish Bible. Stay alert. And it means to be watchful, and it also means to be careful. The days of Yeshua is after the tribulation, according to, to Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That's your homework. Go, go home and read chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians or, or chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, as Paul describes it. That day we are commanded to watch. He's coming. Otherwise, Yeshua may surprise us like a thief surprises a drowsy homeowner. I don't want to be surprised by Yeshua's coming. Do you? You know, in Matthew 24, 43 through 44, it says, But you do know this. Had the owner of the house known when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you too must always be ready, for the Son of Man will come when you are not expecting him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, even though you're supposed to go read the whole chapter. But you, brothers, are not in the dark, so that the day, the day, should take you by surprise like a thief. For you are all people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We don't belong to the night or to darkness. What does he keep on telling us? We are day walkers. We belong to the day, not the night. Correct? So we have to heed the warning. <clears throat> this command to watch is described in terms of these two slaves in, in uh, Matthew 24, 45, and 51. One is faithful. One is sensible. Slave, he's happy when his master returns because he's alert. He's busy. He's, he's done some things, and he's able to offer the master these things when he comes home. The other one is just a foolish slave who has catnapped, who has... Uh, gotten caught, if you want to say it this way, in his PJs, and uh, he's in trouble. Has anyone ever got caught in your PJs? That door, someone knocking on our doorbell rings, and you're like, oh, man, 
two more minutes, I would have been dressed. Now it looks like I'm just slaying around like a bum. Jimmy Dale will come sometime, and I'm still in my pajamas. And you have to say, I've been up for a while. You just feel like you have to say it, even though it's been 10 minutes. It's a while. Been up for a while because, you know, he's been up longer, right? So you have to heed the warning. And the warning is a matter of attitude and action. We have to have the good attitude, the right attitude, and we have to have the right action. The attitude is he's coming. I'm excited about his coming. I'm not excited about what I might have to go through, but I'm excited about his coming. But I also don't want anyone else to miss it. So I need to tell them and warn them. Well, I don't want to offend them. I don't want them to be mad at me. Well, then now we're getting back to my fear and faith sermon. What can man do to you? Listen. If your husband, if your wife, if your children never spoke to you again because you warned them so much, at least you'll warn them. At least when you stand before God and you have nothing to offer because no one else is with you but you're alone, you have separated yourself and offended everyone, at least you did what you were supposed to do and you gave them a fair chance to know Yeshua because you weren't afraid of that. He wasn't afraid because you know what? <clears throat> yes, his wife and his children came, but you know he had other relatives. Right? Uncles and aunts and cousins that didn't believe him. So it's just not, you know, him and his family all alone, and he's a bunch of strangers, and they're heathens anyway, so it don't really matter. I mean, there's a connection there, and they wouldn't listen. So true believers will always be watchful. They will always be ambitious for Yehovah. They will always be ready for his return, even though it is on the other side of tribulation. So watchfulness coupled with an energetic service, must characterize a sensible servant. We are about our Father's business. We are to watch. We are to work until He comes. And that means even through the tribulation. When they tell you to be quiet, you have to speak. That Matthew 25 has three parables, and so we're not going to spend a lot to read those parables because you know those parables. The first parable is the ten virgins, right? Five are wise and five are foolish. So when we look at that first one, Yeshua compares the kingdom of heaven to those ten virgins that are waiting for the bridegroom to come. Are we not waiting for the bridegroom to come? Are we not the bride or the virgin waiting for our Savior King to come? Correct? So this this. Three word pictures are used here to describe the coming of Yeshua. First of all, Yeshua compares the kingdom of heaven to these ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom to come. Five are wise, which means they have sufficient oil and they are able to keep their lamps lit. The other five are foolish, which means they have let their lamps or light or, or oil dwindle. And we know what happens, especially through this ice storm, when you have a generator that's running on gas and a uh, kerosene running on kerosene, if you don't keep it lit, it sputters and spits, and you know it. I was laying in bed, and I hear the generator. You know, you hear the generator as you're going to sleep, and then you kind of wake up. You hear it throughout the night, and then, like, at 7 o'clock, I heard it, and it sounded just slightly different, which means it was about ready to run out of gas. So I hit Gail and said, go fill up that thing. But I realized that was a dream. And so I woke up and <laughs> a nightmare, Gail, that's a nightmare. And I went down, you know, with my hair everywhere and trying to find a coat to go out there and pour gasoline in it. And then it went from that, that back to back to, and I was like, wonderful. I, I beat it. Glory to God. <clears throat> you can hear it. So, you know, you they know that they didn't have enough oil. They knew that they were lacking in oil, but they just didn't care because they thought, well, he hadn't come yet. I guess he is taking his time. So Matthew 25, 6 tells us it was the middle of the night when the cry rang out, the bridegroom is here, go out to meet him. The middle of the night. When do you need your oil? Using the darkest times of your life. 
And a lot of times we don't do and get enough oil because we are in the daylight. And we think it's going to be okay. You know, I'm, I, I've said it before, I'm one of those people who rides the E. Because I'm a faith guy. And I believe that God can sustain me. But I will tell you, I've run out a couple times. But usually I ran out like a couple times on a ramp, and I was so thankful that there was a gas station at the end of the ramp because then you just pretend like you didn't run out of gas as you pour in there. But you don't want to run on E. Now, my mother was different. My mother, as soon as it hit three quarters, she had to fill it up because she could not stand to go beyond three quarters. Now, again, you would think, well, if you were a traveler, I understand it. My mother traveled from my house to here. So you know that even three quarters is pretty safe. I will go from here to Petersburg on an E. When it says 30 more miles, and then you get a little nervous when the 30 goes away, and it's just a line, line, line. So you start praying in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost kind of laughs at you like you're an idiot. But anyway, that's how we run our lives sometimes, right? You just think we've got plenty of time. So <clears throat> we find that these... Wise virgins, um, they are those who know and follow Yeshua. The foolish virgins are merely those who profess to know him but don't have any oil in their lamp. So <clears throat> the marriage supper is attached to that. So the marriage supper is another element in the same, re, uh, same return that Yeshua just kind of finished describing. In, in Matthew 25, 13, so stay alert because you don't know the day nor the hour. Matthew 24, 36, 42, and 44 says the same thing. You must be ready for the Son of Man is coming. You don't know when he's going to be uh, expected. The time of the cry will always be midnight, which is indicative of Yeshua's coming for his beloved at the darkest hour. But I thought Yeshua was coming before the darkest hour. No, when is he coming? At your darkest hour the time of great tribulation and persecution by the anti-Messiah. Because remember, this is in the cycle of the coming of the Lord. So what he's saying is, I'm coming at midnight. When is midnight for you? Midnight is in the darkest time of the tribulation. And remember, if we read it, I think in Revelation and other places, it said, if he had not cut it short, right? It's so horrific that he has to cut it short. So we know that we're there. So <clears throat> the, that same teaching is found in Revelation 19, 6 through 9. Then I heard what sounded like a roar of a huge crowd, like the sound of rushing waters, the, like loud peals of thunder, uh, saying, Hallelujah, Adonai, God of heaven's armies, has begun his reign. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us give him the glory, for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. Fine linen and bright clean it has been given to her to wear. Fine linen means the righteousness steeds of God's people. The angel said to me, Write, how blessed are those who have been invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Then he added, these are God's very words. When is the marriage supper of the Lamb? Post-tribulational. It occurs after the tribulation. After the announcement that he is reigning. We are giving God hallelujah because he has begun his reign. Correct? Well, the second parable is uh, the parable where the timid slave buried his talent instead of using it. You know, he got some of them got some talents and some of them multiplied those talents. And then one guy got the talent and he said, listen, I don't know what to do with this talent. And so I'm just going to bury this talent until the master's return. <clears throat> and we know how God looks at that. He didn't like that. How much talent and abilities and things that we're supposed to do that we should be doing and we're not doing it because we're afraid to do it, and yet God, when he returns, we find that that feeble guy gave excuses about why he didn't multiply it or at least get interest from the bank because what God basically said was this, at least you could have put it in the bank. At least I could have got, what is it now, 1%, 2%? At least I could have got a, uh, three cents off of it when I return. But he returns, and he returns the original talent unharmed at least, but also unused. The faithful servant multiplied the master's investment and were rewarded accordingly. And what we find in is that the master returned after a long 
time. Verse 19 of Matthew 25. He returned after a long time, which means he didn't know. No one knew. So delay must not bring discouragement. My grandmother told me Yeshua was coming. My mother and father told me Yeshua was coming. Now I can either choose not to believe what they said and become discouraged because of the delay, or I can believe what they said and continue to say it to my children and to my grandchildren. And when they look at me and say, you've been saying that, and I'm going to say, yes, I've been saying that, and one day it will be true. So I'm warning you, because the building of the ark started before the rain. So I'm telling you, we're close to the finishing peg of that ark. I would advise you to get ready, because when it rains, I can't do anything for you, because I'm not the one that opens or shuts the door. So what we find in this parable, though, is that both rewards and punishment are given when the master returns <clears throat> to the one who did what he was supposed to do. He's given multiplication to the one who didn't do what he was supposed to do. He is punished. So it's not two separate things. So the righteous and unrighteous are both given their due at the same time. Which brings me to the third parable, which is the most difficult to decipher. Because who are the nations that he's talking about? Who are the sheep and who are the goats? We want to be a sheep, right? But we want to know who are the goats? Who are the sheep? How can nations be judged? Has social action become the, the ground of blessing or punishment? Well, one thing is clear when we look at this parable number three. Judgment is post-tribulational. So is the marriage supper. So is judgment. Look at Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, accompanied by all the angels, He will sit on His glorious throne. What do you think He's going to do when He sits on His glorious throne? Glorious throne means judgment. The judgment seat of Yeshua. So when He comes in His glory, accompanied by all the angels, He will sit on His glorious throne. That is signifies and sets in motion a judgment. Now, the term sheep is significant because we went back to the parable, who stood before him at the throne? Nations, sheep, and goats. So if sheep have done what they're supposed to do, now they're on the right hand, and goats are those who have not done what they're supposed to do, and now are separated on the left hand, it's all happening at the same time, right? So Yeshua is not coming back to pick his people up and then judge them at a separate time. They're all being judged at the same time. His return initiates a judgment, judgment on righteous and a judgment on unrighteous and also a judgment on nations. So it's all at the same time. You don't see a separateness. So that term sheep is significant because we know he's our good shepherd and we are the people of his fold, the kingdom as the fold. And yet sheep are present at the judgment seat. Paul repeats it in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must, what's that word? All appear before the Messiah's court of judgment where everyone will receive the good or bad consequences of what he did while he was in the body. What's it make you want to do? Hurry up and plead the blood of Yeshua over your life and repent. <laughs> so, but the good and the bad, the sheep and the goat, all will be separated at the court of God at the same exact time. There's not going to be good people sitting over there and saying, oh, we already got our good rewards. I got my crown. I threw it out of his feet. Glory to God. Now we're sitting here wait, watching you. <clears throat> no. Next, sheep or goat? Sheep. Goat. All at the same time. We will stand there confident, if you know him, that nothing can snatch us from the Father's hand. Remember John 10, 29, my Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them from the Father's hand. So it's not a time of being afraid or frightened or worried because you know that you know him, and you already know, and he already knows you're not perfect, correct? So it's not a time when you're scared to stand there, but it is still a time when you have to be called out whether you are a goat or a sheep. So the Kahila 
will be gathered together after the tribulation, after Yeshua is returned, and at the judgment seat of Yeshua will enter eternal life. Look at, look at Matthew 25, 46 as I wrap this up. They will go off to eternal punishment, but those who have done what God wants will go to eternal life. Same time. Sheep, eternal life. Goat, eternal punishment. Same time. Same place. Sheep or goat. So what that tells us is that true faith will find expression in loving kindness and service. Because when you read about who the sheep are and you read about who the goat is, which you can go home and reread them, you're going to be finding that the sheep are doing what God wants them to do and the goat will not. Yehovah said, faith without works is dead. So God is giving these pictures, parables. The parable, Matthew 24, as he describes some things, the parables and uh, the conclusions of the days of Noah in 24, the three parables in Matthew 25. He's given us some insight that the present passage <clears throat> in 25 exposes the hypocrisy of calling Yeshua Lord when we do not follow in his steps. And what are his steps? What did Yeshua, what was Yeshua's main purpose on the earth? To do the will of the Father. But what did he, he gave us a clue. What did he come to say? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know what it means, the kingdom of God is at hand? It doesn't mean that he's just here. It means he, it's coming. Even Yeshua was preaching that in time it was coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. That's the purpose. That's our job. <clears throat> we do get caught up in our natural things that we do. We get caught up in our silence. We get caught up in what we're reading. And yes, <clears throat> you still have to work. You still have to do that. You still have to go buy groceries. You still have to eat. You still go out to <clears throat> on vacations. You still go to food lines or Walmart. You still you maintain life. But within that maintaining life should be a preaching, a warning, a pleading, right? Because we see the signs, and we need to let people know that Yeshua is coming. And to be quiet is goat-like. When you begin to search the Scriptures for yourself, that's what I really want you to do through this study, you will discover that there is not a single verse that upholds the pre-tribulation theory, not one. Now, what I said was, don't go to pre trib preacher books and read because they will tear those apart and you will be convinced. Well, there it is. You have to take the word for what it is and go through and look at them and see what that scripture says before you go to anyone else. Now, I know what I'm saying to you could persuade you or, or, or move you to one side or the other. <clears throat> That's why I encourage you to go to the scripture yourself. You won't find one single verse that upholds the pre-tribulation theory but that the uniform teaching of his word, and that's what we're looking for, the uniform teaching of the word of Yehoah is of a post-tribulation rapture. Uniform. Uniform. It has to be in context, and it has to be built on the building block. Right? We continue to unfold. We'll go, you know... I'm not quite sure which direction I'm going. I mean, I'm staying on with uh, post-tribulation. I don't know if I want to talk about dispensationalism a little bit so you understand a little bit uh, or go back to Genesis a little bit before we move further into the um, Brick Kadashah. But whichever direction we go in, we're still going to be plowing the ground so that you understand. When you leave here um, <clears throat> after the study five years from now, you will have a clear distinction of post and pre and um, what the understanding is. All right, any questions? All right. Got a question? Anyone? Don't be afraid. I'm not afraid of your question. If I don't like it, I'll just say we're done. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question at this time. They still do. Let's stand before the Lord. Black raspberry. I knew what you meant. It's really good.
It's great stuff. All I want is all I want is you, Yeshua. see you all on Saturday. Don't forget, if you want to uh, be a part of this Tetra Tech, oh, that's right. Hold on a minute. Um, call them. Up here is the uh, spring festivals, and Friday night at 6 p.m. is our Purim celebration. So we'll bring a covered dish, and we'll eat together, and we'll come in and have some praise and worship, and then read the story, uh, the book of Esther. Friday, this Friday, 6 